welcome everybody who's here and uh, uh, welcome to our DCHS Research Colloquium. And on this one, we're going to be focusing on a three-minute thesis. And what a three-minute thesis is, is it's a, a, a format in which people get down to essentially an elevator pitch for their research. It's about understanding what our colleagues are doing and some of the great things that are happening here uh, at the Toyota College of Health Sciences. The way that this works is I'll call up a, a, one of the speakers. They'll get their, uh, they'll get their uh, presentation up there, and then I will show you a three-minute uh, uh, timer on here. And what I'll do is at 30 seconds to go, I'll give you the 3-0 sign, uh, and then as we get into uh, uh, the, the end, I will give you the time sign. At which point, we got to quit. Any questions about the, about the three-minute thesis? OK. Well, we're going to start. Is Elaine here? Elaine's here. But real quick, Samantha, do you want to put your slide up? Before we get started, uh, okay. Yeah. So just escape out of that. Just. So our first person is going to be Elaine Hewlett, and it's going to be Fit for All: Strategies to Improve Federal Program Awareness and Participation Among Mothers Who Have Immigrated to or Sought Refugee Status in the St. Louis Metropolitan Area. Give her a hand. Wait one second, Elaine. <laughs> Let's just let this get uploaded and then I'll stop. Not responding. Cancel. There we go. Okay, so did you put it on the desktop? Uh, no. Okay, so let's go here. Quantitative data to document their level of awareness about the program. 
Two, implementing outreach strategies to increase participation. And three, developing a mentor program to improve life program retention. I hope that my research will inform best practices for increasing awareness, enrollment, and retention in WIC among women who have immigrated to or sought refugee status in the St. Louis area, and that the results can be adapted by other cities throughout the U.S. to increase participation nationally. Do you have a slide or? No. No. no so we'll just... I do have a need to take Okay. Thank you very much, Elaine, and thank you for sticking exactly to the three-minute time. <laughs> That's great. It's a good start. Um, next is Dr. Maria Roma Palma. She'll be looking at the journey of flavors, exploring the cultural impact of immigration on Hispanics' diets. are not separate domains. They are siblings. They talk to each other and uh, they enrich each other. So for example, in my line of research, uh, while national data reports that Hispanics consume less fruits and vegetables, and there was some uh, data trying to understand and explain why, without the stories of the people um, that we were talking about, we might be making some public health decisions with a significant blind spot. Uh, did you know that Hispanic immigrants experience better health outcomes than their non-Hispanic white peers? But it happens that the subsequent generations don't have the same protections. Uh, so to address this paradox, the Mama Latina study asked um, mothers who had immigrated to the U.S. from different countries in Latin America to tell us their experiences with food and their food choices to feed themselves and their family when they moved to the United States. Um, before I tell you exactly how storytelling can enrich our knowledge of Hispanic diets, uh, let me paint you a picture. So have you ever been anticipating trying out a new restaurant and you're really excited to go? Um, and then you have that sinking feeling in your stomach when you realize the food is just not up to par. And then all of a sudden, you find yourself calculating the amount of time and effort that it took you to get that meal. And all of a sudden, this meal is way too expensive, and there's nothing in the world that you could, could convince you to go back to that restaurant. Well, that feeling, apparently, is a feeling that a lot of Hispanic immigrants experience with the fruits and vegetables they can get in the U.S. Um, in the focus groups that we had with Mama Latina, mothers from Mexico, El Salvador, Guatemala, Chile, Venezuela, Colombia, all agreed on one thing. It is really frustrating to have less access to produce that is of lower quality and more expensive than the produce they have back home. Um, to, <laughs> sorry. Um, the mothers also said that they believed that their health was significant, significantly impacted by the type of foods that they had access to the U.S., and that their children were exposed for the first time to junk food at their schools. Um, the Mama Latina helps us shed study to how stories can help us understand the decisions that people make. And it is important to remember that storytelling is a powerful tool that us researchers can use to create a healthier and more equitable society. We are. Okay. Next up is Dr. Tim Randall. And he will be looking at research supporting sickle cell disease. Here we go. Thank you so much. Go. So, uh, sickle cell disease is one of the most common, is the most common monogenic disease in the world. It's members of 
uh, billions of people affected, and uh, 300,000 children born each year with sickle cell disease. It has the highest prevalence in the poorest countries of the world, like Sub Saharan Africa. Mortality rate is measured internationally for five years. It's uh, very high in, in southern Gulf countries, um, compared to less than 1% mortality in the US. So the mortality rate um, being so high in these other countries is mainly because of obviously lack of treatment. Lack of treatment is due directly to lack of diagnostic testing. So there are three primary genotypes uh, following the umbrella of sickle cell disease, SS, homozygous, AS, um, carriers, we have SC, uh, disease people, and then S, data files. We're most interested in SS and SC because they're in the underdog countries uh, that have black origins, like Haiti, where we do our work. Looking for tests that are very expensive, less than a uh, dollar per test, fairly rapid and easy to perform, don't require electricity or instruments. We developed simple confirm in our lab a few years ago. We've been using it in Haiti for the last five years. It's less than a dollar per test. It's able to um, detect AA from uh, AS or SS at nearly 100% sensitivity specificity. It can detect uh, differentiate AS or SS at about 80% sensitivity specificity, but we're looking to improve those numbers. We wanted a more confirmatory test, so we developed, or we were in the process of developing a uh, confirmatory test we're calling Zyga test. It's based on a different method, but it does require a microscope. We're inducing sickle cell formation right within the red blood cells. And we're counting the number of four plus sickle cells um, over a two, year, a two hour period. And you can see the figure to the right, the uh, red bar are the SS um, individuals. Below that, the blue bar or the blue line is the AS individuals. So we're able to distinguish AS and SS quite well. Uh, we also need an assay for the C. We're in the process of developing that as well. And our initial data was promising. We're inducing uh, hemoglobin C formation intracellularly with hypertonic salt solutions and then counting uh, red cells that have hemoglobin C crystals. And um, so far, the data looks very promising in distinguishing um, um, AC from CC. We can certainly tell when patients have hemoglobin C um, alleles. So, in conclusion, we're able to diagnose uh, patients with SS, AS, SC. Disease using these three assays, all of which are less than a dollar, um, do not require electricity with the exception of a microscope, which almost all of our clients have. Um, and we're able to make these diagnostic decisions, thus being able to uh, diagnose and lower mortality rates. <coughs> So what we did is we almost caught all of the green attributes 
that are associated with core and then assign them to these IPD classes. So it created a very efficient structure in order to be able to address this. So um, two of them are assigned to this new course, IPD 2100. Um, IPD 4200 kind of stayed the same, but we, it really aligned well with, with dignity, ethics, and just society. And then we expanded 4900, which is our community practicum course, to include a writing intensive course and reflection and action. So the 2100 course, we came together to build the course, and we wanted to find a way to have people dive deeper into their identities. In the past, when we've taught IPD, it's always been a part, we've always started from their identity as a health professional. This has really forced us to look at their identity as a person. Then they, then they understand themselves as a health professional. Then they understand themselves as a health professional on a team. And then they work their way through um, this interprofessional identity. We also have them learn about the US healthcare system and understand about global systems, understand about prop, um, uh, societal problems that influence our social terms of health, most types of things. And then we finish up the course with advocacy. So this is, you're gonna better understand yourself, better understand yourself on teams, and better understand how you can impact the system. Um, we have a comprehensive assessment program that includes a pre-post assessment with SACS assessment that we developed here. And we also use course artifacts that are assigned to um, the core. We published an article on this. If you want to see it, you can click on the QR code. So thank you very much. And in an effort 
to disseminate research in an expedited way. You can find me on social media as well, where I post snippets for my presentations and reading scripts to get the word out. Thanks so much.
students actually took me four years to collect this data, and it's only 21 students. Of course, about half of them actually responded to the survey. Now, this group of students only took me nine months to collect this data, and they used simulation on semi-case, and it's 29 students. So you can see how effective simulation can be. This was during the COVID shutdown where our clinic was closed, and Dr. Ripley and Dr. Sackett were not doing cochlear implant surgeries also. But our students were still required by ASHA to get hearing competencies, which is this one tiny spoke of the wheel. So what I did is I did a survey. It was a 10 question survey that I already had students filling out, right? This was four years before COVID. This was before I knew our clinic was gonna shut down. And the 10 question survey kind of had questions chunked with the Likert scale of five. Skills, I call them the three C's. So it was counseling skills, actual clinical skills with hearing impaired patients like can I change the battery and hearing aids. And the other one being, the other final C being confidence. So those 10 questions kind of grew from those three themes. What I found is that students were responding in the surveys that really they felt it was really kind of neck and neck that they responded almost the same. Whether they had an actual patient in person versus they actually had a simulated patient. Some things that were surprising to me were the students that actually had the person in clinic, they actually responded poorer on their counseling skills. I think that's because semi-case actually walks them through an interview and like, you didn't say the right thing, you should do this, which is harder for me to do alone when I'm not watching them 100% of the time, right? And that's hard to do live in clinic, interrupt someone. So that was surprising to see. The only other thing that the students that had in-person clinics said they enjoyed more or rated higher on was they could actually change the battery better, right? That clinical question, because they're holding the hearing aid in their hand where the other group didn't have that experience. So future research is we've identified that simulation can really work, it's effective in teaching, and we're trying to use it more in our clinic. I'm training our other speech pathologist that does a lot of voice and resonance, which is what we consider low incidence. We don't have a lot of patients who come to our clinic for voice. So that's it. And this has some quantitative data. Just students also said qualitatively, I like that I could uh, participate with audiologists and ENTs, which they wouldn't really do in our clinic. Thanks. Thank you. environment 
What's depicted in our yellow is a surface, and that surface can be either biotic or abiotic. Abiotic being like a medical device, biotic being like other tissue in the body. And when the bacteria, they're kind of sampling, they're sampling the environment at that point in time. At some point, they make the decision to firmly adhere, and that's what's depicted here in the central part of the model. When they decide to adhere, they stick very firmly, make a, make a poly uh, uh, matrix, and then they start building the structure. And that's when they become antibiotic resistant. Up here on the upper panel, you see a diabetic patient that has a lower uh, limb wound. It took a month and a half of a researcher physician who had a special standard operating procedure for uh, wound infections but that patient was able to recover from that wound. The antibiotic resistance is shown here, and these are what antibiotic, uh, this is what biofilm looks like. This is biofilm here. This is how we can identify biofilm. And here is actually what it looks like in the tube.
station, please. Thank you. Nice job. Thank you. Well done, everyone. Um, we did record this on Panapto, so it'll be available for um, other faculty members to see in the college. Um, this is just the beginning of our scholarship committee's um, commitment to showcasing the work that's being done by our faculty and our graduate students. Um, uh, I'm sure you got a notice about um, the scholarship week that we're doing in April. Um, we will provide opportunities for posters, um, actually over a two-day period. Our goal is to put them all over the building. So when people walk to the building, they're going to, we're repurposing the bulletin boards in the building for two days, and we're going to be presenting research posters all over the building. And we will have um, some sort of a, um, contest. We're just trying to work out the details of that. Uh, moving forward, and then on the uh, on that Wednesday, I believe it's the 26th, um, from one to four thirty, we're actually going to be doing longer presentations. So we'll be doing um, uh, 20 minute presentations, and um, uh, we will encourage both faculty and PhD students, of which we have a few here, and other other students that undergraduate and graduates that would like to present. So you can choose to apply in whatever format you would like to present. If you'd like to present a poster, there'll be that opportunity. If you want to present um, a platform presentation, there'll be that opportunity. So, um, and then once again, we'll wrap it up with a scholarship on tap at the end. Speaking of that, we have beverages. We have some food, courtesy of the Dean's office. And I um, encourage you to hang around um, and uh, talk about the good work you've done. But congratulations to everybody on your outstanding presentations. The truly outstanding things is taking all those complex ideas in your head and squeezing them into three minutes is uh, <laughs> quite a Herculean feat. So, well done, everyone. And uh, thank you, uh, Dean Rousseau, for stopping by. Good to see you. Uh, thank you for all your support. We appreciate it greatly. So, um, yeah, so help yourself. Let's, uh, you know, and feel free to ask each other questions and talk about your research and maybe build some new collaborations. Thank you.